you know this before. I just want to let you know that uh, things go a little differently. Discussion here. I'm not here to pontificate or you know wax eloquent. Um, sometimes I do get carried away and I just start talking, but that's okay. Just raise your hand and say, "Hey, Jeremy, <laughs> bring it back." Right? Um, but uh, we're, we're here to learn together, right? As as, as, as iron sharpens iron, we're here to learn um, and to glean from one another. We uh, we try to stand on uh, the, the command of Paul in First Corinthians, where he says, and "Whenever you come together, each one of you should have." A verse, have a song, have an encouragement. There's uh, 54 times in the New Testament we're told to do something one to another, right? Love one another, encourage one another, build one another up. Uh, but there's very few commands to get up and wax eloquent and pontificate. So I'm, I'm not here to do that. So um, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand I'm, or just start talking. I mean, of course, do everything with an order, right? But I, I'm not here as uh, somebody who is... You know, uh, I am educated, but that doesn't make me any smarter than anybody else here in this in this room. Okay, just so you know, I'm not I'm I'm not here standing with a, a title. I'm, I'm just Jeremy. Okay, that's why we, we don't do titles here. You won't hear. Uh, we might refer to each other as ministers, but we're all ministers uh, of the gospel. So don't uh, don't take that as a, a title. That is just the reality of it, right? If you here are a believer in Christ and you stand. As a member of the body of Christ, and you are a minister, whether you like it or not. And uh, that's kind of that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today, is uh, what it truly means to, um, to preach Christ. And sometimes it is going to be things that are going to be offensive. Sometimes it's going to be something that is, um, you're going to question yourself sometimes. Wow, did I, did I do that right? Am I, am I screwing up here? Uh, and yeah, we probably are, but that's okay. I mean, you're right, but you, you, you learn by doing Right? How many of you know how to ride a bike? You just can't raise your hand. Uh, did you just get on and you were perfect the first time? <laughs> liar. <laughs> somebody, just, just so you know, somebody said yes. That's why I said liar. Okay. <laughs> I just don't wait. wait oh my gosh, she's so, so mean. No. Um, I, come on, don't, don't be real. Be real, right? Uh, babies, babies born and they just start walking and talking. I mean, granted, there's there's some points of maturity that have to come, right? Some 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 growth points that have to occur before babies are able to talk and able to walk, right? There's things that have to happen within their body, right? The reason babies can't walk, it's, it's not because they don't want to. It's because literally their bodies are just cartilage, right? I mean, they still don't have bone. They still have structure. They don't have the, uh, the tendons, the strength of the muscles. And, you know, a lot of times we're referred to as babes in Christ. Well, there's a reason for that because you just don't know how to walk yet. It's not that you don't want to. And it's not that you, you can't, you can try, but it's going to take some time, right, to, to reach maturity. And, you know, that's talked a lot about in, in Scripture is maturity, right? We have uh, Ephesians chapter 4 talks about the reasons why we have all of these giftings in the body, and that's to bring out a perfection or a maturity of the, of the believers. Um, 1 Timothy 3.16, you know, all Scriptures God breathed, used for the purpose of teaching, rebuking, and training in righteousness, so that the... Man of God may be fully equipped for every good work. It's not something that just happens overnight. Now it can. Don't get me wrong. I fully believe that through his spirit he can do whatever he wants. But usually there is a point of learning and growing. Right? And that's what we're here to do together is to, to learn and to grow. And I don't have all the answers. And if you think you have all the answers, here's the mic. You, you Please. Right? Um, I'm just here because I have a mouth and I'm willing to use it. <clears throat> And sometimes I use it a little too much. So it's okay. Feel free, like I said, raise your hands, ask questions. Um, if you feel like you have something that could contribute to the conversation, don't be shy. Raise your hand, you know. And, you know, we'll, uh, whatever is said, we'll decipher it and work on it together and decide, hey, is this something that the Spirit's saying or is this just the wisdom of man trying to speak, right? So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through uh, a little bit of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So, um... If you have your Bible, which, if you have a cell phone, you have a Bible, so you have no excuse, right? I know, you guys are all looking at, oh man, I know. So go ahead and, you know, open your cell phone to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, well, first go to your Bible app. Of course, I shouldn't have to tell you how to do this. Uh, if you need help, the children are in the back, they'll come and show you how to use your phone, <laughs> right? Oh, gosh. Um, so, uh, so... 
one thing we also always talk about anytime we discuss scripture is um, we want to understand three things about what we're reading. And the first is the context, right? We don't take anything out of context. We, we want to read the scriptures before and after of everything that we, we discuss. We don't want to just pull something out and say, oh, this is, this is the truth because I read it. Well, did you read what came before it and what came after it? Because that usually brings some clarity to scriptures. So context and the content, right? We don't want to take things out of context or out of content because if, if we do that, we are completely abusing scripture for our own purposes. And the other thing we need to understand, the third thing we need to understand is who the scripture, this, this letter was originally written to and why it was written to them. And usually if you go to any of the, the epistles, the, the letters that were written by Paul or, or any of the other um, authors in the New Testament, they pretty much always say at the very beginning, you know, who they're writing to, why they're writing it, and, um, you know, give some content and context and give some audience. So it gives us a little better clarity about why these things were written. Because um, when we understand all these things, it gives us a little bit more understanding. That understanding, knowledge, wisdom, all these things begin to work together to help us mature, Right? Because it's really easy uh, to, to take something and, you know, hold on to it and, and not understand truly who it's written to or what it's actually written about. It just sounds good, right? You ever, you ever have one of those scriptures and you're like, you read, you're like, oh, this sounds great. And then you read what comes before it or after and you're like, oh, yeah, that does not mean what I thought it meant. You ever had that happen? Yeah. It's, and that's why it's important that we always read a little before and a little after. So um, at the very beginning here, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, written by Paul. And uh, it says that it is to the church of God which is in Corinth. So that's why it's called Corinthians, because it's written to you know, the people of Corinth, right? And those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ and uh, called to be saints. This is an interesting statement. You're called to be saints. He doesn't say those who are saints. There's a, there's a, there's a difference there, right? Uh, and we're going to talk about that a little further. But uh, it says uh, to those who are sanctified in Christ. So we know this is written to believers, this is written to fellow believers. And this is an important thing to understand because we want to beat non-believers over the head with what's in 1 Corinthians here, right? And say, oh, well, you've got to understand this and you've got to get saved. And, well, no, the, the starting point is you need to be a believer, right? Those who, who are uh, sanctified in Christ Jesus. And so that's also something I want to discuss right now. If, uh, if, if you're here this morning and you haven't made a proclamation of faith and you are not sanctified in Christ, let's, let, let, that, let's let that be a starting point for understanding, okay? So... If, if you're sitting here and you're like, well, I not really can't say that I'm sanctified in Christ, and I'm not 100% sure that I am uh, following Christ, and I have not made the proclamation that Jesus is Lord, well, you can go see one of those two people sitting back there, and they'll uh, walk you through that process, and then you can come in, and we can start uh, start with this discussion here, or you can catch up later on, on you know, YouTube or our Facebook page in order to uh, catch up with the rest of that discussion. Um, but that's, that's a good starting point for understanding what it is we're going to be talking about today, because... Uh, and a lot of the things that we do here in this room with this ministry is dealing more with the things that believers deal with, right? We're, we're talking about what it means to truly be a member of the body of Christ. We talk about what it, it truly means to be sanctified and delivered and set free. And that's, a, that's the, the foundation of what we're doing here in this room today. So that's why I want to make sure that we're all on that same page. So everybody's kind of on that same page. Okay, all right, that's good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. See, I had nodding over here too? Yeah, 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 okay, all right. I, we're not going to make you stand up and pledge allegiance or anything like that. It's just, just want to make sure, right? If, if you say that you have proclaimed Christ as Lord, we're okay with that, right? We'll know you by your fruit. Oh, <laughs> that's a more tough one, right? <laughs> it's easy to say it. It's harder to do it some days, right? Okay, but what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk a little bit about wisdom uh, and and what is so important about wisdom? Uh, what are the hang-ups of wisdom? What is the end result of wisdom? Well, first we have to start with the, the very beginning, because that's a very good place to start. Uh, and that has to do with where does wisdom begin? All right, does anybody, anybody have some ideas of where wisdom begins? What, what are we told? Wisdom is... Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? Right. That's a good one. That's a good one. What else? What else comes before wisdom? 
What's, a, what's one of the building blocks of, of wisdom? Knowledge. Knowledge? Yeah, I like that. Knowledge. What's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Knowledge is what? Kind of a root word there. To know something, right? You know that that chair is going to hold you up, right? And so you trust, right? Trust is part of wisdom also. You trust that it's going to do what it's designed to do. Now, if you sit on it and it falls, now you know wisdom is to not trust that chair again, right? So uh, knowledge is, is pretty basic, right? It's, to, it's, it's, it's a, a building block. It's, it's a foundational part of wisdom because sometimes we can have knowledge, but if you don't know what to do with it, then you, it, it's nothing, right? It, anybody else's mind full of useless facts? Right? I mean, I love useless facts, but they're just that. They're useless, and there's not much that I can do with them. Like, not that there's anything wrong with the little thing that Linda read, but I'm like, fish can live out of water because there's that one fish that he, he like, gets in the mud, and he, like, buries himself in the mud, and he dries out, and he, like, he goes without water for years, and he looks like a fossil, and you pour water on him, and he comes back to life, and oh, man, it's so amazing. That's where my mind went, when Linda's like, fish can't live without water. I'm like, oh, yeah, right? <laughs> and then uh, trees can't live without soil. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're in a hydroponics? I know how to do hydroponics, right? It's water with minerals and a solution, and you wash it over the roots, and it lives without soil, right? Gosh, that's what knowledge does to you. <laughs> That's knowledge. Knowledge is bunny trails. <laughs> I'm telling you, knowledge can be amazing, but um, as we're gonna read a little bit, you know, knowledge kind of puffs up, right? Kind of makes us proud. Well, I know, right? Um, one of the things that you, you learn, well, you should learn at a young age, is how to listen to people, right? Usually listening involves you paying attention to what they're saying. But um, I'm one of, I'll be honest with you, I am one of those people that when somebody's talking, sometimes I have a tendency to just like start thinking about my day, right? Uh, I get distracted, they say one word, and my mind just goes, woo, bunny trail, right? And that's my knowledge just taken off. But that's not listening, right? That's not engaging with somebody. Or, or the moment they say something and you're like trying to go in your mind about your experience with that situation, right? You know, they're talking about how the one time, you know, oh, I just got pulled over for speeding, and you can't wait to tell your story about the time you got pulled over for speeding, right? Are you that like that? That's usually not listening. That's kind of, I'm proud of what I know and my experiences, and I can't wait for you to stop talking long enough for me to tell you about what I know and my experiences. And uh, that's usually not a good place to start when it comes to listening, right? Uh, listening is usually one of those skills that just requires you to zip it. And truly listen. Not, not try to fix it, not try to engage, not try to think about what you're going to say next, but just listen. That's hard, isn't it? Because, because knowledge, we, we put our trust in our knowledge. And so we want to share what we know the moment that somebody is explaining a problem that they're having. Right? It's like, it's like going to the doctor. <laughs> we just talked with Alex a little bit. You go to the doctor and you want to tell them what's wrong with you. Right? You, you, you're telling them your experience. And it's like the doctor like totally goes off in the left field. And he's like, you know, you're, you're, they're talking about you, your foot's been hurting. And he's like, well, how about your hands? Have your hands been bothering you? And he's like, Doc, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here about my feet. Could you listen to what I'm here for? Well, how you been sleeping at night? Right? Are you stressed? It's like, dude, that might have something to do with it. But let's talk about my foot, right? And, uh, and it's one of these things that, and that's why it's called they're practicing medicine because it's just they're trying to figure out what we go to. No offense to any doctors, I'm just joking. I'm just joking a little bit. But um, see, that wisdom tells you when not to make sarcastic comments, and I struggle with that all the time. So uh, everybody's in First Corinthians chapter one, right? I've given you plenty of time to turn to that or open the app, right? So we're going to start reading uh, in verse eighteen, and. Um, I usually like to have somebody in the uh, sitting down read through it. So if, if you haven't, I would like somebody to read uh, verses 18 and 19 for me, please. If you, if you would. Nice and loud so everybody can hear. Don't be shy. <clears throat> okay.
Frustrate the intelligence? Yeah. I think, yeah, that is kind of frustrating. Okay, so the message of the cross is foolishness. Ooh, foolishness. I'm okay being called a fool. Okay, so here we go, a little personal information. Um, I was born on a holiday, but not a good holiday. Like, I'm not a Christmas baby. I'm not a Thanksgiving baby. I'm not an Easter baby. I'm an April Fool's baby. Okay. Um, foolishness is something our society frowns upon. And every time I go anywhere, they're like, birthday, and I'm like, April 1st. And they're like, liar. I'm like, no, it's not a joke. No, you're fooling me. No, I'm not. Literally, my birthday is April 1st, right? And uh, I can't tell you how many times growing up, that has just... <laughs> Everybody wants to make a joke about April Fool's Day, right? So, oh, you're a fool. <laughs> you're a fool. Oh, my boy, April Fool's Day. All right, so you know what? When I finally came to the understanding and some maturity in my, in my late teens, uh, early young adult life, um, I was okay with that. I'm okay being called a fool because there we go, right? The wisdom of God is, is, is foolish, right? It's foolishness. The message of the cross is foolishness. So I, I kind of realized that it's, it's okay to be a fool sometimes. Um, because I don't mind being a fool for the right purposes, the right reasons. Um, but this is what I want to also point out. Uh, it's foolishness, foolishness to those who are perishing. And uh, we'll get a little bit more into that when we talk, uh, as we get further into the passages here, about exactly what Paul's referring to there. Um, but what I love is this next statement. And uh, remember what I said that at the very beginning, it says, um, to those who are called to be saints, right? And this next statement here that Paul makes, it says, but to us who are being saved. That's pretty deep. Being saved. Not who have, who are saved, who have been saved. Okay, so once again, I am a, um, a kind of a linguistics geek, right? And when we break this down, we, so just also full disclosure, we homeschool, so you know our whole family is involved in the education of our children. And uh, when we look at this sentence, to those who are being saved, what, what is, when we look at that and at the tense, right, you got three, different, different tenses. You got your past tense, your present tense, and your future tense. But when you look at that, it says, it says you are being saved. Is that something that happened previous? Is that something that's happening now? Or something that's happening in the future? Uh huh. Are being. You are being saved. It means you, you, you began the process, you're in the process, and the process shall continue in the future. Isn't that a nice thing to understand? <laughs> you're going to mess up, you're going to make mistakes, but you are constantly, currently, and in the future, being saved. And this is coming from a, a guy who literally saw the face of Christ. On, on the road and was blind and like literally studied at the feet of very well known and knowledgeable people. This is Paul. And he says, he didn't say you guys are all being saved. It says we are being. To those of us, so he includes himself in this, are being saved. I, that's that right there in and of itself is enough to pause and think, right? Because we see this instance where we know that the work of Christ was completed at the cross, and we know that the act of salvation was finished at that point, right? Our our way of achieving salvation was finished at that point, but we are being saved. That's important to understand. Because it doesn't matter how much you think you know, or how much you know you know, or how wise you've become, or, uh, or how complete you think you might be in Christ at this moment, there's still more for you to experience. There's still more. The potential that you have 
is well above and beyond where you are at this moment. And this goes for each and every one of us. The kids, the parents, those of us who have been believers for 30 some odd years, those of us who have just got saved this last week, right? We are being. It is a constant and continual thing. And now we've talked about this a little bit, but it's uh, the focus here is about um, being saved. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a constant thing that's going on, right? Paul talks also in other, in other books, he says, daily renew your mind. Right? It's, not a, it's not something that's just going to happen and you can just be satisfied knowing that you're saved. Right? It's something that has to happen on a continual basis. And this is the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Right? Knowledge is, yeah, I'm saved. Wisdom is knowing that I have to continually be saved. I will be saved. I am, I, I was, I am, and I will be on a continuous basis. But what are you saved for? Because a lot of people want to say, oh, well, this is my get out of hell free card, right? And I think that's enough. And if that was just enough, then you wouldn't have to constantly be saved. You wouldn't have to continually be saved. But when we look at this, we're, we're seeing that we're not looking at something that we're running away from. It's more about what we're running to, right? We're not saved for the purpose of just getting out of hell. We are saved for the purpose of looking forward to what God has called us to do, to the, the better, the newer, the higher things each and every day that he is calling us to, right? And so that is probably the most awesome thing about all of this is that no matter what we think we know, there's more. No matter how saved we think we are, we can still look forward because God has a better thing for us than even what we got right now. Because I mean, it, we got a pretty good thing going right now, right? I mean, as, as believers, we got a pretty good thing going, right? We know that um, we're not bound to the curses of this world anymore. We know that we can have freedom through everything that Christ has said. We know that, that we are heirs to the promises of God that were made throughout generations to people in the past through Christ. I mean, that's some pretty good stuff. And it's, we can just sit back and say, yeah, I'm good. It's good enough. But We've been called to so much more. And this is what we're going to read as we look further, right? And this is part of what it means to destroy the wisdom of the wise. Right? Because what does earthly wisdom say? Earthly wisdom says, if you've got a good thing, you better just hold on to it and don't do anything else. Right? you got a good job, just stay in that job. Just keep working. Just keep putting away money. Right? Not, there could be something better. Right? Earthly wisdom says, if you've got a good thing, just hold on to it. Don't change. Just keep going. But what godly wisdom says is you got a good thing, but there's more. And sometimes you got to step beyond what you're comfortable in in order to reach these better things. Right? And, uh, you know, like you're looking at me like, oh my gosh, he's up there talking. I could never stand in front of somebody and talk. Well, do it. <laughs> One day you're just going to have to do it. Right? You think, God's never going to equip me in a way where I can stand in front of somebody. Talk. Just do it. Just start doing it. Yeah, I, don't worry. You'll be there one day. Yeah, I, you're like, not me. I ain't going to happen. I ain't going to There's no such thing as being shy when it comes to the kingdom of God. I'm just going to say that. Right? Let me say it one more time. There's no such thing as being shy in the kingdom of God. Now, you can say that God's called me to do something behind the scenes. That's great. But don't be shy, right? Because he has called you to these things. And this is one thing we have to, as, as we re read down further on, uh, it says that he's going to bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. That's a, that's a really wordy statement. Let me read that in the Amplified Bible here. Um, this is one reason why I encourage you guys. This is why I like digital Bibles is because I can cross-reference things very quickly. Uh, and I don't have to carry around like seven different scriptures. Seven different, uh, you know, translations of the Bible. I can go through this. It says, um, the cleverness of the clever I will nullify. The cleverness of the clever. We think uh, in our society we see, you know, clever people, right? What does it mean to be clever? Uh, let's, let's, let's quantify that statement a little bit first. To be clever. 
witty, smart, always having a quick comeback for everything, right? Oh, that was clever, right? It's going to get nullified because it's, uh, it's, it's standing on their own wisdom, right? Just like my whole statements about the, you know, the fish and the tree. That was clever, right? I mean, it's a clever thing. But, but really, it doesn't bring completion. It doesn't bring, um, it doesn't bring peace to the situation. If I would have stood up at that moment and been clever and said, no, that's not true. Trees can live in, in, in hydroponics, right? Would that have brought life to the situation? Thank you for that. Would that have brought life to the situation? No. Would it have clarified anything for anybody? No. If I would have, well, what about that one fish that can live outside of water for up to three years, right? Would that have done anything for anybody? No, because that moment, Linda was speaking from a point of wisdom, right? And, and from a point of encouragement. And if I would have stood up and tried to have been clever, that would have been clever. And even now you're looking at me like, well, why did you even bring it up, Jeremy? Because it all just kind of builds on to this point that what we see as funny and witty and clever sometimes just completely tears down and distracts from what God is trying to do and God is trying to, to, to build. And this is why sometimes it's sarcasm is, as much sar as I, as much as I like to be sarcastic, I have to realize that sometimes sarcasm is, is not correct in a situation. And you know, sort of watch over my tongue and control myself and have self control, right? You know, all those fruits of the spirit gotta happen. Gosh, ouch. All right. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and go back to uh, back to the. The uh, verse 20. If somebody could read uh, 20 through 21, please. Just 20 and 21, please. Nice and loud for me. It's got to be somebody different. Please. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the seer of this age? Has not God made the image of this world and the world? The things in his wisdom of God, the world in wisdom do not know God. The seed of God is the root of the world, which he should say the world is the seed. Mm. So I'm going to start at the end of that section right there. And it says, uh, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to, the, to save those who believe. Um, so this is an important thing to think about, is that God used some pretty foolish things to bring about the gospel message. Right? Uh, fishermen, tax collectors, probably the lowest of the low of the society. Right? These, are, these were not your highbrow scribes and Pharisees. Uh, and you know what? Could somebody also just read the next two verses for me, 22 and, and 23? Because this is an important uh, thing that I want you to understand here. Um, 22 and 23, if somebody could, please. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Okay, so verse 23 there. It says, we preach Christ crucified. Crucified, excuse me. Now, let me just also say, this is not a good statement for a church. Right? We shouldn't always just be pre preaching Christ crucified. The reason why Paul says it in this instance is because that state, the next statement after, because it was foolishness to the Jews. Right? And why was it foolish that their Messiah was crucified? Why was, why was it foolish? Come on. Let's think. What, what, did, what did the Jews want? A messiah. A, a messiah. What did they want? A kingdom. A kingdom an earthly kingdom, right? We, we read about when uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, right? And all the people were laying their coats down in the road, and they were waving their palm branches, and we, we have uh, a moral, a moralized this um, Immortalize this, sorry, not immortalize, immortalize this through Palm Sunday, right? Where, you know, oh, blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, these people weren't looking for a guy to come die on a cross. They were, they were doing this because they expected Jesus to come in, uh, riding, uh, leading an army in to destroy the Romans so they could have an earthly kingdom. They were not looking for a restitution between God and man. They were looking for a resolution or a revolution. They did not want restitution. They wanted a revolution, right? They wanted a revolution of the Jews to rise up and to overtake and to, to tear down all of the, the, the Roman buildings. And this is why the message of preaching Christ crucified 
is foolishness to the Jews is because they were not looking for somebody to come and die and be that final sacrifice. They were looking for somebody to come and kill to be that ultimate king. This is why when it says Paul preached Christ crucified, it was foolishness to Jews. And this is why as the church, when we're dealing with people who are not Jews, it's not necessarily we should be preaching Christ crucified because we need to be preaching Christ resurrected. We need to be preaching Christ alive. Because that's where change is going to come. Because that's where the revolution occurs here in this society. And this is why it says that uh, the Greeks are looking for philosophy. Right? Because in philosophy, the wise don't die. Well, except for like Socrates, right? He killed himself with, with uh, poison. But the wise don't die. Usually they are, they are immortalized. The wise are put onto pedestals. And the books are written about them. And society adores them and honors them. This is what they were looking for. The Greeks aren't looking for somebody to die for them. The Greeks were looking for somebody to lead them, to philosophize, to talk to them about important things. Sorry. Yeah. They wanted somebody to, 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 to tell them how to be better. Right? To tell them how to think better. And Christ didn't just necessarily teach them how to think better. He wanted them to actually be better. Not just, not just think better, but to do better, to live better, to experience better. And this is why it was foolish to those who were looking for philosophy. But what have we turned the gospel into today? It's not a revolution. It's philosophy. Right? I mean, I can't say you're flip, flipping through the TV on a Sunday morning and, well, Jesus wants you to live a, bi a better life. Yeah, he does. He also wants you to be a fool. Right? Or you, you flip through and Jesus wants you to, to be prosperous. Okay, yeah, he does. But he also wants you to give everything like he did. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, you, you're, you're flipping through and you're, you're listening to, to preachers and they're like, well, if you treat people good, they're going to treat you good. Right? No. No, because he says, he says if you're truly preaching the gospel, people will hate you. Why will they hate you? Because they're looking for somebody to... To follow as a human, like the, like the Jews did, they wanted a leader to lead them, or they want someone to make them feel good about themselves, to make them feel good about what they do and how they do it. But Paul says, everything in this world is dung. Do you know what dung is? If you don't know, come visit us on the farm and you can come shovel it. Okay? It's... It's stinky, it's refuse, it means nothing, it has no, well, it does have value, because see, here we go again, the useless facts. <laughs> Manure is amazing for gardening. But anyway, but everything else is dung compared to the gospel. That little good feeling that you get when you hear the word Jesus said, it's dung. It's not about feelings, it's about change, right? Now, change can bring good feelings sometimes, but if you're just seeking after Christ because you want a good feeling, it's, it's foolishness. It's foolishness. It's not wisdom. That's not what he came and died for. He didn't come and die so that we could feel good about ourselves. That's not what he's here for. He came to change us and through us see the world change. And that, that's a... Uh, we just had elections this last week. And there was a lot of people that were either very excited or very disappointed with what happened. And let me just tell you something. Jesus didn't come to change our government. I know that's, that's, a, tough, that's a tough one to understand, right? And um, he, he came to establish his kingdom, right? This is why the Jews considered him foolish, because he didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom. And if you're more concerned with who's governor or who's president or who's a senator than you are with proclaiming Christ, then you, you got some soul searching to do. Then you need to look for and seek after wisdom. And this is, this is the answer to those few questions that are in verse 20 there. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Because the wisdom of this world says what? If you want to change the world, you got to change the government. Right? Isn't that what the world tells us? 
right? If you don't like something, then you just gotta vote, and then that's gonna change, and these things are gonna get better because the right people were voted into the right things. No, that's not true. <laughs> that, that is the wisdom of the world, and uh, it is what, let's see, uh, what does it say about that? Um, uh, it's gonna be destroyed, it's gonna be upended, it's gonna be uprooted and cast away, Where is the scribe? Why is he asking this question about the scribe? What's important about the scribes? They were the ones who wrote the smart things, right? They, they, they took care and they wrote down history so that uh, that wisdom of history would be communicated to the future generations so they knew what wise things to do. And Jesus tossed all that out when he came as a, lion, as a lamb to slaughter. He tossed all that away because the wisdom of the world and the scribe says that in order to do better and have better, we have to change who's in control of the earthly kingdoms. And Jesus said, no, that's, that's not what we're here for. That's not why we're here. Wisdom, God's wisdom says, take care of your own growth, right? We have to, we have to come to a point where uh, Paul says we have to seek after and secure our own salvation. Now, that doesn't mean we can save ourselves. But that means that we bear some responsibility in that being saved part, right? What is our responsibility in the being saved part when it, Paul talked about there in the beginning of this section here in, uh, in, in verse 18 there? But for those of us who are being saved, what is, our, what is our job there? What is our part to do? Confess, believe, right? Lay down our own will, lay down our own desires. What else? What, what's our other job? Oh, crew, crucify the flesh. Right? Why don't we put that in a song? Right? Uh, what, what else? What's, what's another one of our responsibilities? Yeah, right? Because what's that going to, is, is uh, spreading the gospel going to give us, is it going to bring wealth? Not likely, right? Uh, is is uh, communicating and, and spreading the gospel, is, is it going to bring power and influence within your community? Maybe, if your community is a Christian community, right? right? Maybe. We're called to build communities, right? But not in the same way that the world is building community. Right? Because the world builds community in what? Well, I'm just trying to find a bunch of like-minded people that I can sit in a corner with, and we can all tell each other how good we are, right? Isn't that what the world talks about as building community, right? You've got this community over here in the corner of this city, and this community over here, and this community over here, and this community over here, but yet Paul says that in the gospel there is no Jew, there is no Greek, there's no male, there is no female. Pretty much all the things that we classify, we use to classify ourselves within communities is all dumb. I know that's rough, but it's true. Everything we use to classify ourselves within communities, it's, 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 it's useless, it's meaningless. There is no wisdom in these things, in this, this foundation that we've established saying that we have to create community, a worldly community, because the community of Christ looks like this, right? This is what the community of Christ looks like. It looks like a, a group of people who have come together, who have sacrificed their earthly identity, who have sacrificed their earthly desires to see the kingdom of God spread and the kingdom of God built. And sometimes it also means that we have to sacrifice our own pride because it's foolishness. It's foolishness. The message of the cross is foolishness to the to the wise of this world, but they're perishing, right? And so we want to bring them to a, a true knowledge and understanding. And uh, verse 25, I'm just going to read, uh, 24 and 25, I'm going to read these last two. It says, but to those who are called, both Jews and Gentile, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So when we preach Christ, it is power and wisdom. And, it's, and uh, verse 25 says, The foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Man, that is uh, God at his weakest 
is still stronger than the strongest. And God at his most unwise point is still wiser than man. I, and while all of this is hard to understand because I don't and could never see God as foolish and I could never see God as weak, we still have to understand that his way is not our way. You know, his, his desires are not our desires. Because even when we see, uh, when we put ourselves on his path, right? What, is, what, what, is the, what did Jesus say about the path of righteousness? It's, it's narrow, right? Uh, but the wide is the path that leads to destruction. And when we, when we look at that, we think that, well, you know, the wisdom of the world says, well, everybody else is doing it. Let's just follow along, right? The strength in numbers. You ever heard that statement before? Strength in numbers? Wow, this is not true. <laughs> Foolishness in numbers. Uh, usually, you know, there's a, something I, I tell my kids all the time. I say, if you see this as a popular thing on social media, it usually means it's ridiculous and you shouldn't do it. Uh, if you see something that is, a, is trending, then that usually means it's, a, it's, it's, it's not for us, right? Uh, that's not a narrow way. That's a, a pretty, pretty wide way. And so when we look at wisdom and we look at knowledge, Knowledge is one of those foundations, right? And I, I love it. You basically know and ledge. Isn't that funny? Knowledge, know and ledge. What do you do with a ledge? You put stuff on it. And it's the same thing with knowledge. You have to start building on what you know and acting on it before it becomes wisdom. How many of you guys have read through uh, the first couple chapters of Proverbs? Right? Everybody who should have raised their hand or shook in their head. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right, yeah. Yes, Jeremy, we've all read through Proverbs, right? Uh, it's pretty, pretty simple and pretty basic when you, when you look through it and you understand uh, what knowledge is. And I love how, um, who, wrote, who wrote Proverbs? Thank you. Okay, good. I love how Solomon, he's, he's talking to his sons, and he, and, he, and he calls wisdom a herb. Now, let's just... Step back, and in Hebrew, words have gender, just like in Latin. Have you ever studied Latin? Right? Latin has everything, every item has gender. Whether it's an army, whether it's a chair, whether it's a sword, everything has gender, and it's, it's similar in Hebrew. And uh, wisdom is feminine in gender. And that's why he says, pursue her, right? Something that's desired. And obviously, as a, uh, as, as a man, Solomon was encouraging his, his boys, his sons, to pursue her wisdom, right? And it says that, you know, wisdom is everywhere, right? She's walking in the streets. She's shouting out from the, the, the walls of the city. It's there, but you have to pursue it. Right? And it's the same thing with, you know, knowledge is, is an understanding of something, but if you don't build on it, right, you know that you should do, what, what you should do, right? That's wisdom, that's knowledge, knowing what you should do. Um, you know, Paul talks about, you know, uh, you, know you, you understand something, you, we're seeing dimly in a mirror, right? That's, that's knowledge, you have a little bit of understanding about something, but wisdom is actually doing what you know to do. And that's part of, as a, as a believer, of con of, of being saved. Right? You are being saved. That's part of what wisdom is, is understanding that you don't know everything. Isn't this, isn't this amazing? Wisdom is knowing that you don't know everything. Isn't that just a, isn't that just one of those things that that is it's confounding once again to the wise, right? Because you think earthly wisdom states that if you have wisdom, you know everything, right? If you are a professor of something. You're an expert in that field. But as a wise believer, I know I don't know everything. But I know that I have the capability to learn it. I know that I have the capacity to learn it. And I know that I have the best teacher to learn it. Right? Following the Holy Spirit. And this is one thing that I love about, about Proverbs. When he talks about pursuing wisdom, 
If we as believers are pursuing the Holy Spirit, that wisdom will be granted to us. It's, a, it's an act. It's something that has to be sought. It's something that has to be desired. Right? It says, if you desire wisdom, you desire a good thing. And I think that we have to, you know, the world wants to look at, at Proverbs and talk about, oh, it's, it's a book of wisdom. Well, it's not necessarily. It's a book of how to achieve or acquire wisdom. And so when we read through it and it says, you know, you know the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, we, we also have to understand that fear is not just, you know, fear, right? It's, it's a reverence. It's, it's a desire to know. Fearing, fearing of the Lord is, I don't know, but as I, as I seek after him, I will begin to know, right? And begin to, to experience the wisdom through the Holy Spirit. Now, have you ever been in a situation and you didn't know what to do? You're like completely confused. Totally confused. Knowledge tells you you're confused and you don't know what to do. And so you pray and, and you just get this little leading. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like a, a pin gets stuck in your head and it's like, this is what you need to do. Do it. And you're like, okay, and you do it. And, and things turn out way better than you would have ever expected. Okay? So people say, well, that was just following my conscience. No, you weren't. That's called the Holy Spirit, people. Okay? That, and wisdom is knowing whether it's the Spirit leading you or it's my own desires leading me, right? And that's one of the things that we have to as believers is constantly seek, constantly desire these things, right? And this is why Paul, once again, daily renew your mind. Because it's going to be very, it's very easy to get set in the past and in the history of something and, and make judgments based upon, well, it worked like this before, right? You ever, you ever made that judgment before? You ever made that? Well, if I, I, last time I was in this situation, I did X and things turned out just fine. You ever been in that situation? And you do X again, and it does not turn out just fine? Well, that's because you, you didn't renew your mind. You were holding on to, to yesterday's revelation and not understanding that you need to seek after the wisdom of today through the Spirit. And this is, this is going to be a constant struggle as we, as we push through this world because the world's going to say everything that we're doing, right? Uh, you, you give. When the world says hold, right? You, you move when the world says stay. You stay when the world says move. And in everything that we do as believers, we're going to constantly have the world saying, yeah, y'all are idiots. You're foolish. Not just, not just foolish, because foolish just means you make a bad decision. Ignorant. Idiots, right? We, we've, been, we've been called worse. We've been called worse. But when we, when we truly are following the leading of the Holy Spirit in situations, when the world says one thing and we're going in a completely different direction, we're going to be that, uh, that fish swimming against the current. You know, um, We're going to be that, uh, that tree living in the rock. What was that? It's playing music. Was that you? Please put all of your phones on the side with the phone. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so so we, we have to constantly look for ways and seek after God to find ways to be wise. And sometimes that just starts with saying, I can't do this on my own. Right? Reaching that end of ourselves. And that re that's part of, of, of what it means when we are renewed, is we, we, we come to an understanding where I just can't, I can't do this on my own. And that's why sometimes one of the, the, the bravest things we can do is to say we can't, right? And we've reached that point. And I think that's maybe why some of you guys are here today, because you reached a point where you just said, I can't by myself anymore. And I've reached a point where I've recognized that I can't do it in my own strength. I can't. I can't overcome this addiction. I can't overcome this, this sickness, this disease. I can't move past this point in my life. And it's time to have something renewed, right? Uh, I was standing outside looking at, um, 
I do this sometimes, standing outside while you guys are singing and just praying. And God brought my eyes across the banners out there. We are revival, right? And, you know, I, as, um, as somebody who's, who's been a believer for a long time, sometimes I don't like the word revival because I'm like, well, I'm not dead. I don't need to be revived, right? I don't need somebody to come in with some spiritual paddles and, you know, shock me back to life. And, but when I, when I kind of looked at it, I said, oh, God, what, what, are, what are we trying to do here? What, what's, what's, what's the point? Someday, do you guys ever have that question, that, 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 uh, that conversation with God? What's, what's the point? Right? Because sometimes as, as humans, we just want to be told what the point is. We, we're trying to depend on our own knowledge and wisdom. And to, to, uh, to look at that word revival, right? We, to live again, to be renewed. Uh, but that's what we have to do. Every day, each and every day, right? Renew our minds. We have to revive his purpose in us. We have to look for a uh, beginning of that day, that renewing of our mind. So I, I just want to encourage you that you're, you're not here for, you did not come here by accident, okay? Um, this is a beginning of wisdom for you today. Today is an opportunity to renew something inside of you so that you can push on and still continually be saved each and every day, right? It's a, it's a constant thing for us who are being saved. You're in good company today because we're not coming and, and, and praying from you guys with you guys from a point of we have arrived. We're praying with you guys from a point of we're going to work with you through this today. We're going to, to strive and push with you for that renewal, that revival, that point of us all working to be saved. Isn't that an amazing thing? It's, it's, it's so nice to know that we are all working to be saved. Not because we're doing it in ourselves, but we have to submit Right? We have to submit. And so I just want to encourage you today that find that place of submission, and that is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom, so that as you go through your life and the world is pointing and laughing at you, you know that their wisdom is just foolishness, and that you are working towards something so much greater, so much better than what this world has to offer. You're working towards something that is eternal, not something that's going to fall away, okay? And so with that, Alex, do you have anything that you would like to share? No? We just want you guys to know that when you come back, we're just going to take a five-minute break, use the restroom, get an opportunity to you know, get a drink, say hi to one another, hug some necks, do what you need to do, and we're going to come back here and we're going to work together. For that beginning, that renewing, that revival to occur, uh, not only for your soul and your spirit, but for your purpose, for that opportunity for wisdom to begin in your life, that opportunity for knowledge to, to be laid down, right? For the foolish things, because things are going to look really foolish sometimes, for those, fool, those things that were considered foolish in the world to, bring, to bear fruit in the spirit, all right?